Well, welcome to the show, Christina. Great to have you. Thanks so much for having me. Well, I guess we should start with a million dollar question. They say nothing prepares you for having kids. Do you feel the CIA training prepared you for having children? I do. Strangely enough, there are so many skills from espionage that are applicable to parenting. Who would have thought, right? (laughs) But people do ask me what's harder, being a spy or being a parent. And I almost always say being a parent because it is so challenging and humbling, right? (laughs) You, You just other parents until you find yourself in a similar scenario later and then you realize, oh, (laughs) so it is, yeah, (laughs) it's a humbling job. (laughs) Now, you start the book by saying you didn't dream about joining the CIA and you also weren't necessarily big on having kids early on in your career. So can you just talk us through a little bit of your backstory and how you ended up, one, in espionage and and deciding to start a family? Sure. Well, I started uh, by way of what I studied in college. I studied linguistics and African studies and Swahili and Zulu. And the thought was that I would do humanitarian work or, you know, document some dying language in Africa in a village. Just really loved language and fell in love with the culture of East Africa. And I was unexpectedly recruited by the CIA on my campus. I had an interview around the same time frame as I interviewed with Peace Corps. And I received offers from both. And I will say that the interview with the CIA just went completely differently and better than the Peace Corps experience. I did not know who I was interviewing with. I just knew it was a government agency interested in applicants with foreign language. I initially skipped the interview and lied and said I had car problems because I was seeing Lady Smith Black Mombazo about four hours away from my school. And <laughs> then I did have car problems. And so that, that was a lesson I learned from my mom. You don't lie about things like that because then they will happen to you. And the recruiter stayed an extra day to meet with me. And like I said, it was just such a fantastic interview experience where I learned about the ability to influence U.S. policy and educate the president and other policymakers on a part of the world that I felt really passionate about. And I would be able to travel you know, to the continent and really use that expertise. And so that really excited me. And so it started this amazing career in espionage. And I found that I had a lot more career ambitions than I had once thought. I had you know, grown up in the Midwest and my plan was to get my MRS degree when I initially started college. But as I became you know, more excited about my studies, everything kind of shifted and continued to do that as I got into further into this career at the CIA because I was, you know, it's a very intense environment, a lot of type A personalities, it's very competitive. And so having a family became further and further away (laughs) from my plan. And then actually the second half of my career at the CIA, I got into clandestine operations and was able to actually go and meet with assets in the field and collect intelligence and learn kind of that cloak and dagger side. Before we move forward, there's something neat there that I just want to tap into for our audience, and that you didn't seek out to find classes to put you into CIA. You were following your interests. You were following things that you got enjoyment out of, that you were compelled to, 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 to take an interest in. And we see it all the time from our clients how many people are living lives because they think this is what their parents want them to do, or this is where if they were going to get into this certain field, they have to check these certain boxes. But when you're doing that, I find it difficult to get excited about something that you think you're supposed to be excited about rather than following this, this inner guide that is like showing you what exactly you should be doing. Absolutely. That's such a good point, Johnny. I, I, I've always said that if people are studying something or doing a career that they're passionate about and really genuinely interested in, they're going to be more energized and you're going to be more successful. And so I think, you know, people, family, friends were a little bit worried that I was studying something so niche, but I was genuinely interested and excited about it. And luckily I was young enough that I wasn't worried about, you know, the things, the responsibilities of life and how I was going to pay bills and stuff. I just kind of thought it would work out and thankfully it did. But I would say that the question I'm asked most often if when people are interested in a career in the intelligence community is what should I study? 
You know, how can I make myself competitive? And I always say, listen, the national security priorities are going to change. So if you're choosing to study something because you think that's going to make the CIA want you, like that's the wrong way to go about it. You know, study something that you actually are interested in because it's going to change. And there are plenty of people too that study something and then they're end up working on a completely different area because things do change so much uh, in national security. I mean, there's always those big, you know, hard targets that are of interest, but things kind of come and go and, and what's kind of the hot issue. And so I, that's a great point that you made. And that, that is what I did. And I, and it's thankfully worked out thus far. (laughs) Now, Swahili is not a language that I think many Americans even encounter. So how did you know that that could be a major and like, how did that spark your interest? Well, it's funny because I knew I wanted to do linguistics because I knew I had a knack for foreign languages and not just learning them because the way that I learn isn't necessarily through like listening and picking it up. Like I don't have a musical ear. Like I learn from actually looking at the structure and understanding how language works. And so in high school, I studied Spanish and Latin, but I basically slept through the classes because I was bored. And so I knew I wanted to do something something that was just really different and not an Indo-European language. And at that point, I was thinking humanitarian work, right? So I was thinking, okay, I want to do a Bantu language with a completely different structure because it's so interesting, but I want to do one that is spoken, you know, in a lot of places and, you know, a lot of people so that I can reach more people doing this kind of aid work that I was thinking I would do. And so naturally that became, you know, Swahili was the best choice. And then I studied Zulu right before I graduated because, you know, it's just so fun. It's such a great language. Language. It's so difficult. It's very, it's similar enough to Swahili that it's, you know, makes it confusing to learn. <laughs> um, but it's really difficult with the clicks and sounds and stuff. But it was fascinating. Now, you mentioned earlier that your career was taking off. And I think for many women in the audience, that is a challenge weighing career and starting a family and reaching that decision and, and worried about how that might impact your career. So if you could just talk us through a little bit of your decision-making process on truly starting the family, what that looked like for your career, uh, especially as it was really picking up steam. You know, I spent my 20s in in the agency and, you know, I was dating and I always like to say it's kind of like sex in the city, but at the CIA because, you know, you're living in this bubble and everyone you're friends with and dating, they're all there because, you know, we've all gone through these extensive background checks and <laughs> polygraphs, psychological testing. So, but my number one thing was my career. And I became very much a workaholic and I worked these crazy hours, but I loved every minute of it because that's just the stage where I was in life. And, you know, obviously over time that changed and I decided I I wanted to have a family. And it's not to say that there aren't plenty of people who stay at the agency when they have families, but for us, we're a blended family. And so our custody situation at the time meant that we wouldn't be able to take my husband's kids overseas if we continued. And so that's why we resigned. My husband's also a former CIA. And, you know, it can be a very family friendly organization. But as a woman, there is always, I know I, Johnny's laughing. <laughs> um, but as a woman, there are, you know, it can be, there are challenges. And I actually think back and I cringe about the way that I treated some new mothers when I was there as a young analyst. And it was the only thing I had going on in my life. And I didn't understand why it wasn't number one in everyone else's life, right? But some people, you know, men and women had families to go home to. And I just had no empathy or understanding for that, right? Because I was just very like single focus on my career, getting ahead. And I just, I'm, I'm actually friends with a former colleague of mine. Now we keep in touch and who, you know, know, we would butt heads, you know, early in my career because she was a new mom and I was not in that stage of life. And, and, you know, it's only now that I look back and realize what she was balancing and what she was juggling and just have so much respect for that. And, you know, the women that have kind of, had kind of paved the way before me, which were the reason why I was able to have the career that I had, right? It was all the women that had shown that we had the ability to do all the things that men were doing. We could run clandestine operations, even if we had kids, right? And so I'm, I'm thankful for that. But yeah, it's, it was a, it, it can be a tricky balance, but there are a lot of tandem couples and there are a lot of people who do go overseas with kids and have fantastic experiences as well. I just want to note, because I think for the rest, of this conversation, I will be snickering uh, on the sidelines here for a few things. But I just want to say, as because I view the CIA the same way as 
you might view a linebacker. So in a linebacker, offensive lineman, uh, you only hear their name if they're doing something wrong. <laughs> yes, yes. That's, that's such a good comparison. Oh my gosh, I've never heard that one. That's great. Of course, as civilians, we the only time that we're hearing about the CIA is in context of something horribly wrong happening. And, and of course, in today's time, it just everyone's just like, oh my God, it's the CIA, what are they doing now? But we don't hear all the good stuff that the CIA does. And so, yes, I'm going to be snickering because of that dichotomy, duality. There's a lot going on there. And so it's like in my head swirling, but I just want to state that for all of the terrible things that we might put on the CIA, there are so many wonderful things that they're executing across the world. I don't know if executing is the word you want to use, Johnny, or maybe it is. (laughs) No, that's a really good point. We we'll, we like to say that it's only a policy success and an intelligence failure, right? You don't hear intelligence success. Like if it's successful, it's the policy. And if it's a failure, it's always the intelligence community. So that's absolutely right. There's so much that's not known. And and that's why, you know, it's been a transition for me going from a career in the shadows where all of the things you're doing well are not praised and in the spotlight. And now I'm talking publicly about what I did. So that was definitely a, a change for me getting used to this talking so publicly about this lifestyle. But yeah, you're absolutely right. There's so much good that isn't known. And one of the things that I talk about in the book is, you know, the values at the CIA that I think aren't really known, like trust and loyalty. And the trust between an operations officer and their asset is so important. And it's something that's taken so seriously because you're protecting, you know, their physical safety and their life, which is also their sometimes their families as well. But you're really creating that bond of trust so that they feel comfortable providing that intelligence. And, you know, it's not like you see in the movies where, you know, people are being blackmailed or forced to give information. You know, it's really done in a way that there can be a lot of integrity, believe it or not. And so these are some of the skills that we talk about applying uh, to parenting and teaching our kids how to build trust with others, you know, through common ground, developing rapport. And a lot of that has to do with making them well-rounded and exposing them to a lot of interest so that they can and create that rapport and that trust with people. And that all comes from, you know, what we learn in operational training at the farm, creating those relationships. And really, it's not just applicable for parents. These are skills that adults should have. I mean, in the workplace, it's so much easier to accomplish your goals if your colleagues trust you than if they don't, right? That's like the number one thing. And when I left the agency, I first went to Amazon and I was working in information security. And there were barely any women at all. And um, this was several years ago. I don't know that there are any more now, but I don't know. I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, I always said it was like bizarro world where there was always a line for a men's the men's bathroom and there was never a line for the women's restroom and that should really just say it all <laughs> yeah. uh, but when I was there I really had to rely on some of these skills to build trust because you know I was coming in from the CIA, which I openly shared, but that immediately meant people didn't want to trust me. I couldn't really talk about what I had done. And then I was also a woman. So I had all of these strikes against me. So I really leaned on those skills I learned through CIA training to build that trust and rapport to help me be successful there. When I think back to my childhood, I think about the impact of relationships, but in a unique way. So I went to a small Catholic school. Everyone was very similar to me. And then I got to college, and that's when I really encountered diversity, diversity of thinking, diversity of religion, diversity of culture. What I found really fascinating about your relationship building tactics at the CIA is this idea that you know you have to build trust with assets who speak a different language, who grew up in an entirely different culture, who probably don't even have many similarities in terms of experience, and yet you're building this massive level of trust with them to get the information, to build the relationships, to open doors for the CIA. So I'd love to bring break down how we can instill that in children in simple ways that they can really create these relationships that I find so impactful, not only in adult life, but as young kids to really get past bullying and some of the problems we're seeing in schools. 
That's a great question. I, you know, with kids, I think the number one thing that we really focus on in our family is exposing them to a lot of different interests, not in like a tiger mom kind of way, not in like overbooking them for activities, but in terms of giving them a variety of skills so that they're more interesting. Because when you're more interesting and you know about more things, there's more of a chance that you can make a genuine connection. So for example, you know, some of the cases and the the pitches that I saw fail at the agency. When I say pitches, I mean, you know, like pitching someone for recruitment or whether it's like a cold pitch, if you hadn't met them before, um, those failed when they weren't based on like genuine connections. When someone was trying to pretend to be someone they're not like, oh, you're interested, you know, in swimming, I'm interested in swimming, but you're not really, you don't really know anything about it. Right. And so when we give our kids these skills and I mean, it's anything from sports to music and arts and the outdoors, all of these things, we're positioning them to make those connections with people, but also it's about exposing them to the world. And of course, that's been something that's more challenging over the past few years as the world has shut down and we've been, you know, isolated from the pandemic. And so there were some things that we did, you know, during those years, because our youngest, we have five kids and they range from four to almost 20 years old. And, you know, our younger two were very young when the pandemic started. And so obviously they weren't able to experience a lot of things that we wanted them to and so we try to bring the world to them. And so one of the things that we do, and I do this with a subscription box now, but it doesn't have to be a subscription box. Like those, those can get really expensive and unreasonable, but you can create it yourself. So when I first started doing it, I would just go to Costco and pick out some sort of international food, right? And then I would go online. There are so many free resources to get like coloring pages, to get you know the flag from whatever country the food is from. And then we sit down, we actually still do it. We started during the pandemic and still do it. And we sit down once a month as a family, and you have to go through and try every single food. Like that's the rule. You have to try every food. If if you don't like it, it's fine. It's one bite. And then we learn about the country that we're eating the food from. We talk about the language and, and there's really, and we do trivia and there's something for all of the kids, every age level. And that's been a way that we've kind of been helping them open their eyes to the world during a time where we couldn't actually travel. Now, ideally we'll be able to travel, um, you know, my kids are still little and it's kind of hard, but we're <laughs> hopefully we'll get to do more of that. But there are ways to learn about the world and, and give them that diversity of thought um, from our home and low cost options as well. I feel like that cultivates curiosity too. So by exploring all of those interests and maybe realizing like, hey, I don't actually want to play guitar or I'm not actually interested in swimming, you're still fostering a curiosity that's so essential to building these relationships and building trust in other people. Because the less interested you are in others, the less interested you are in the world around you and what's going on, well, the more challenging it's going to be to build those great relationships in your life. Absolutely. And I think knowing when to let go, you know, if our kids decide that they're not interested in something that they've tried, like knowing when to let go and say, okay, you've tried it. So they have some experience in it. They can speak to it to some level. And that's the same for us as adults. You know, we might try something and decide it's not really our thing, but at least we know enough about it that we can talk to someone who may be more interested in it it and say, oh yeah, I tried that at one point and it went like this for me. How do you do that? Asking questions and building those connections. The other point that I'd love to chat a little bit about is obviously joining an existing family and building trust with kids that aren't your own can be challenging. So being not only a mom, but a stepmom, there's dynamics there within the family structure that you encountered. And I'd love to hear how you use some of these trust building strategies within your own family. You know, trust is so important in a blended family. And I think that was really what I leaned on so much in the early days of our relationship because Ryan and my husband had three kids. And at the time when we met, they were six, eight, and nine. And I was really aware of building that foundation. And so the way it looked in practical terms was that obviously any discipline always came from Ryan. And even still to this day, we still kind of fall back on that because I'm always very aware that I don't have the same foundation that he has with the kids that dates back, you know, to their birth years. Uh, For me, it was much later. And so it's built slowly over time. And I really have to be aware of that. And getting to know each of them, they all have different personalities. And relationships change over, over the years. Our oldest is in college now. And I would say that even though she's not here, it's probably the best our relationship has ever been because she's getting into those years that I think all kids 
regardless if you come from a blended family. Once you start to get into your 20s, you start to realize all of the things that your parents did for you and you become more appreciative. So my relationships with each of the kids are different and they changed over time, but I definitely was looking for ways to connect with them early on based on their interests and based on their personalities. A lot of, we talk about give to get, you know, giving a little bit of information so that they'll talk more and really listening is such an important skill set, listening to what they want to talk about and connecting with them on their interests as kids and and really just being there for them. Something I talk a lot about in Licensed to Parent is this, this trust in a family and the words, I promise. It's such a big deal in our family. We use that phrase sparingly because we take it so seriously. And by, you, by doing it that way, when we actually do say it with the kids, it's, it's almost like it gives them a piece and whatever they've been asking that they're done, like they feel good because they know that when we say, I promise we mean it and we follow through. And I think that that's something that I didn't really understand before meeting my husband. And it was something he was doing with, we call them the bigs, but they were little at the time, but it was something he had been doing with them. And I was thinking of promising, you know, it was something like a pinky promise on the playground. It's like, oh yeah, I promise. Yeah. But it's so, it's just so much more than that in our family. And I think that it's important for our kids, you know, whether it's a blend, blended family or not, to know that when we promise something, that we follow through and that we, you know, say what we mean and mean what we say and that we're going to be there for them. And so I think that's really been the number one thing with my bigs who are my stepkids is for them to know that I'm going to be there for them. And I think that because, you know, Ryan and I have been together 10 years now that because I'm still around, I'm still here and that I've, I've shown that I'm dependable, I'm reliable, they can trust me. And, and that kind of grows over time. I think that's the most difficult part of it. Because regardless of CIA background or not, we can all surveillance our loved ones all day long if we want to. But of course, that's certainly not going to breed trust. There's a certain amount of intimate darkness that needs to be there that we can trust that, that our loved ones are making the right decisions, doing the right things, and being honest with us. And that doesn't happen when people are surveilled all the time. Oh, yes. And I would say uh, one of the questions I've gotten the most uh, about this book is, oh, so you're a spy, so you're teaching people how to spy on their kids. And I'm like, well, actually, this book is all about giving your kids independence and autonomy. So it's, surprisingly, we don't spy on our kids. We we give them a very long leash. And that was something when I met Ryan that he was already doing with the kids. And as someone who's, I'm naturally just an anxious person. And I was immediately like, wow, he gives these kids like a lot of freedom if I have kids with him, I'm going to do things differently. Uh, but of course, you know, if you've read the book, you know that that's not how it's gone. <laughs> and I've realized that these skills actually make me feel more comfortable giving my kids a longer leash. And you hit the nail on the head, Johnny, because if we're spying on our kids and not trusting them, that's the quickest way to erode trust. And there are so many different programs right now that parents can use if they want to have an eye into their kids' phones and where they are and track them. And that's, I like to say that's a personal choice for every family. But what I do recommend is that if a parent does choose to do that, that they be transparent with their kids that they're doing that, right? So that their child knows that there's no expectation of privacy. Now that's going to have other <laughs> consequences of using that approach. But the quickest way to erode trust is them finding out that you have this program on their phone and you didn't tell them about it. We prefer to do things a little bit differently and balance that, giving them that autonomy and trust. And our kids know that when they do break our trust, it's a really big deal. And it's not about what they did. You know, if there's dishonesty, if there's lying, the response they get from us is like, is listen, I'm less upset about what you did and I'm more upset that you lied. And so that's what you're in trouble for because you have broken our trust. You know, we've given you this autonomy and that means we can't continue to give you this autonomy, right? And so there is a level of you're not always going to know what they're going to do and they're not always going to do the right thing. I mean, we as humans, even as adults, we don't always make the right choices, but we need to give our kids the opportunity to make mistakes, the opportunity to fail so that they can learn from that failure. And hopefully the idea is with things like technology that they're going to fail while they're still with us so that we can help 
them learn from these failures. And if we keep them, you know, I see all these parents who don't want their kids to have any access to social media, any technology, so they lock everything down, but you're setting them up to have to be completely flying blind when they get out of the house and you can't keep them from everything. So why not expose them to things so that they have you as their guide so that you can help get them through so that when they are out of the house, they're more likely to make better choices you know, on these mediums than they would otherwise without that experience. Well, it's all also clear that you value them being well-rounded. And so in order for that to happen, there has to be some autonomy for them to be able to make certain decisions based on their interests and curiosities to go pursue those things rather than having all of that being controlled and watched. Yes. And I think that goes against so much of what we've seen in the parenting culture over the last several years with all of the technology that's out there to track our kids, to keep them safe. And it really plays on, I think, parents' biggest fears and they make money off of it. And, you know, some of it can be really useful, but we also need to keep it in check and use it for when it's helpful, but not let it get carried away. I'm curious, what does discipline in a CIA household look like? (laughs) It's very balanced. And I will say that there's always this constant push and pull between Ryan and me because I have to remind myself that they can have more autonomy, right? We're like on opposite ends of the spectrum and we meet in the middle, which I think is perfect because naturally, like all of these things that I'm saying do not come naturally to me. It has been a learning process for me. I think probably if it was just me by myself and I had never met Ryan, I would probably be like a super intense tiger helicopter mom. (laughs) I think that's like my inner, you know, because I just, I'm anxious. I want to keep my kids safe. And so it's really remembering what I learned in the CIA and like shifting my brain to be like, okay, I know all these things. All of these things apply here and they're capable. They can do more than we think they can do, but we have to let them try. But with Ryan, he's just like naturally not a worrier. And he's, it, all of this does come naturally to him because he, he started in operations on the clandestine side and that's where his whole career was. Like he lives in the gray and I started on the analytic side. And so I've always been naturally a more black and white thinker, but of course I ended my career in the clandestine side. So I learned to live in the gray. And so it's always this push and pull of like me saying, well, I don't know. I think we need to do more because obviously they're not learning. They wouldn't keep doing this. You know, the other night they left, uh, we got home and like our gate, our driveway gate was open and the front door was unlocked. And Ryan calls our teenager and says, tell me why the door is unlocked and the front gate's open. And she's like having fun with friends. You can like hear them in the background. And she's like, oh yeah, my bad. Yeah. And like he gets on the phone and like my response is, well, I think she needs to just come home right now. And he's like, are you what? And I'm like, well, obviously it's continuing to be a problem. You know, it's like this, I want this immediate. And he's kind of like, is more level. And he's like, listen, we talked to her about it. If it happens again, you know, then car keys are gone. Right. So it's like this, it's balance. It's good to have two parents that are just, you know, very different so that the kids don't get like one extreme or the other. Yeah. I definitely feel like that's essential, especially in, in parenting that you're the team, right? And it sounds like in this you are a team that's far more important than them getting two different sides of the coin and not knowing what to expect as kids. Exactly. Well, the other thing as a, as a parent as well uh, is that children are not stupid and they know when that team is fractured and they know how to play each parent off of each other when that fracture shows up. Uh, I'm 49, but when I was uh, a teenager, my parents split up and I quickly learned how I could leverage it to my advantage. And I did. And I don't, I don't think there's a child who's going to recognize that and not do that. That polarity and that back and forth also keeps the kids on guard for them to know that there is no control. The parents have to come together and speak to each other in order for any sort of control to be going on, which leaves the the kid with his hands up, hoping that the parents are able to do that and wanting them to do that. But once that's fractured, uh, it's go time for the kids. It's not going to take very long for them to realize what what they need to do. Well, and I think it's so much about, like you said, being a team and having each other's back. And so I have to tell this funny story about our six-year-old. It was a couple months ago. So he was... I think still five at the time, but he was up late with having a special night with daddy. And I must've put the other, our youngest to bed. And I wasn't down there. They're on the couch. And he says to dad, 
let's watch Transformers. <laughs> and dad says, well, I don't know. We need to make sure. I don't know if we should watch that. And he says, it's okay. We won't tell mom. <laughs> and like Ryan thought it was like the best thing in the world because our son is so much like me and is so black and white naturally and like such a rule follower to the point that he can be anal. And so Ryan has been like really worried about his ability to like go with the flow and, you know, live in the gray. And so when this happened, Ryan, it just warmed Ryan's heart because he's like, okay, he's going to be okay. He's going to, you know, of course Ryan's response was no, you know, we can't do that without mom. And, you you know, and then we talked about it, but he was secretly like, you know, celebrating that he could live in the gray and, and not be so uptight. <laughs> well, uh, that's, I love that. That's so good. How have you and your husband dealt with the technology and all of these tools? And of course, your kids growing up with these tools, myself being 49, I certainly didn't have any of this technology and even having a Commodore 64 and a, and a ton of games. I didn't take interest in it. So it wasn't a big deal. And besides, the graphics back then weren't, weren't anything that you could get interested in. And right now, I mean, there's full virtual worlds being developed that these children can, can easily fall into and lose themselves in. We actually, the video games are starting to come up with our six-year-old because he's, he's wanting to play Minecraft. And the way we've always been really discouraging of any video games at our home because we just prefer our kids to be in the outdoors. And so our bigs have learned to play video games, I think, with friends and to a certain extent. But we just don't like them <laughs> because we want our kids to be engaged in our family. We'd rather play games together as a family or be outside enjoying nature. And I mean, we live in the Pacific Northwest, so that's a really big part of our lifestyle here. Uh, but I also think it's important for our kids to have some of those skill sets. And I do think that with all of the technology that there is today, that they can learn really great skills. And what I don't want is my kids to not know how to do any of these things, right? And so it just all comes back to that balance and giving them that exposure. But in terms of being online, we really want to teach our kids how to be online in a safe way. And a lot of the skills that we learned at the agency, the, the way that we looked at people's vulnerabilities and learned about people online, developed targeting packages, those are that makes us see things a lot differently when we look at what our kids are putting online and what we're putting online, what people can learn about us in terms of you know pattern of life and, and those sorts of things. And so we want to make sure our kids know how to be safe what to share online, what not to share online, and that people aren't necessarily who they say they are, and all of those things while still learning how to go about it. And look, we're not going to be able to keep our kids from seeing bad things online. I mean, that's just not realistic. If they don't see it on their own device or at our home, they're going to see it on the bus or they're going to see it at school. And so I think the main thing is to have that relationship of trust with our kids so that they feel comfortable sharing things with us when they do see something that maybe they think is inappropriate or they're exposed to something or they meet someone online or, or whatever it is. When we have that relationship and they're willing to open up and share things with us, then they're going to be safer because we can give them that guidance. And so really, I mean, I know I've said it a lot, but it comes back down to that trust and then critical thinking skills. That's something that I think is emphasized so much in CIA training because when you get on the job, whether you're an analyst and you're writing for the president's daily brief book right away, or whether you're going out and running an operation, you are trusted with so much responsibility. And especially when it comes to clandestine operations, you're working independently. You're going out and meeting an asset you're sometimes paying them thousands of dollars. You're coming back with a handwritten receipt on an index card that you've written, and you're being trusted to do this on your own. And so we learned so much about you know, learning how to do that and giving that trust. And we want to do that same thing for our kids and have that foundation there so that they do feel comfortable sharing with us. I think another big part of trust and obviously being part of the CIA, you understand propaganda on both sides quite well with decline of institutions, mainstream media, the propaganda being pushed online, trying to sort through what is reality and trusted sources has become more and more challenging for adults and kids. And obviously you're adept in this skill set as part of being the CIA. What's have you taught your kids around trusting information, who to trust online, so that they can make heads or tails of what is this reality around us? 
It's such an important issue right now because they're just inundated with information and things that are news or aren't news or different bias news sources because every news source does have a bias. Every person has mindsets and biases. And so first of all, teaching our kids what that means and that it exists and that we're all going to view the world in a certain way based on how we grew up, where we grew up, what our parents were like, our race, our religion, our class, you know, everything, all of those things play a role in how we're going to view the world. And when I in my early years at the agency, I was working on foreign media analysis. And we always looked at sources and had a description of, you know, what way they were leaning and what their bias was. And the same goes for American media as well. And that's something we start teaching our kids because we want them to understand that. And there are so many different ways we can show our kids and illustrate this point. We can, you know, pull up certain news stories or certain news sources and say, look, these stations are covering this topic. You know, this channel over here is covering something else entirely. Why do you think that is? Or comparing the headlines and how they, you know, there are all these exercises you can go into with your kids to help them start to identify. And when you really know that you've done it well is when like your high schooler comes home and tells you that like their teacher was teaching about whatever, fill in the blank issue. And they're able to recognize that their teacher wasn't teaching fact. Their teacher was teaching their opinion, which obviously is a whole other (laughs) issue. But that happens. That happens. Happens and and even teachers can sometimes you know become political one way or the other and and you know make a mistake and share their own opinion. I mean, I think that the best teachers are the ones who we have no idea what their personal beliefs are because they're so great at teaching objectively and sharing all the sides so that people can make their own opinions. But that doesn't always happen. And so we want to make sure our kids know that because what we don't want is them just coming out of a class parroting whatever their teacher told them they should believe, right? We want them to be able to make their own decisions and think critically. And so that comes with learning about these different mindsets and biases that even they themselves will already have because they're formed, you know, so early in our lives. But being aware of them, I think is the most important thing. It's such a great point. I think for many of us, we look up to teachers, especially from a young age, and view them as infallible and view them as seeking and telling the truth. And oftentimes, we're all human. We, we can't get around our own biases and in the way we cover information, teach it to our kids. Uh, and certainly, in some of the classes I look back on in my own education, I now view it differently, realizing that there were political leanings influencing the way those subjects are being taught. Absolutely. And we all, I mean, we make decisions as parents about what we want to teach our kids, what we believe, and everyone is going to choose to do it in a different way in their family. We're choosing to do, you know, some particular topics more objectively, which I would have never in a million years thought that I would do. And so, you know, I find myself having conversations with my four-year-old and six-year-old saying, well, some people believe this and others believe this, but we don't really know. What do you think? And I'm like, who am I? Um, (laughs) Whereas the conversation in another family might just be, we believe this this. We, our family believes this. Other people believe this, but this is what we believe, right? And so everyone's going to choose to do it differently. We're choosing a more kind of free thinking, um, objective approach. And that seems to be working for us for now. But I like to say, and I say this throughout Licensed to Parent, is that everyone has to find what works for them and their family. There's going to be different levels of independence that feel more comfortable than others. And then even within a family, kids' personalities, I mean, from the time they're babies, are just so drastically different um, or can be so drastically different. And there are going to be some kids that are ready for a certain level of responsibility at one age and others who maybe hit that age and aren't ready for that same level of responsibility. And so we need to figure out what's comfortable. So I always say, take what works and leave the rest. And we're just inundated with so much parenting advice. And so like my hope is that people will just say, okay, this this is what works for our family or I like this part and I'm gonna adjust it and use it in this way. But there, it's really just about skills to help our kids be successful in life. And in order for them to be successful, they need to be prepared for things like emergency scenarios and danger, you know, how to spot and avoid danger. But then also a lot of what we've been talking about is these interpersonal skills, the communication, persuasion, how to get what you want. I mean, those are important skills and it doesn't have to be in a manipulative way, right? I know we're talking about espionage, but (laughs) um, you know, there's all these different skills and it's just about preparing our kids so that when they leave the nest, they're self-sufficient and and ready for whatever life throws at them. And that really comes from this idea when CIA officers are trained 
is that they are prepared for anything and that anything you encounter in training is going to be more difficult than what you encounter when you're out there completely on your own, you know, uh, running an operation by yourself, just you and the asset. You need to be able to think on your feet, think critically and operate autonomously. And so we want our kids to have that same confidence as well. It's hard to understand what's going on in their mind because you're only changing and seeing their shoe size change, right? But if you can understand that that those growth spurts are happening happening physically then it then it's easy to go well that's probably going on mentally and emotionally as well those, so those kids on a trajectory that can change on a dime they can hear something see something that can radically change the way they've been viewing things so it's it's constant upkeep it's constant checking in and spending time with them so that they do feel comfortable and this Go talking about whatever is going on in their mind. That that time spent, they're not going to be able to wiggle out of that, and that's that's when they slowly start to drop their guard. I have said it on this podcast, but my dad would do if he needed to talk with me. He wouldn't come into my room and say we need to talk about this because he knew that I would be on guard and that I would be difficult about it. He would pick some chore or th- project that we would have to do that we would have to spend all day together now, on rides going to go into the lumber store and just be there there's no way out of it and so i had to uh, sit there until eventually all of these things would be able to come out that's great that's a great approach and we do that a lot with our kids especially if we feel like oh something's going on with one of them like our teenagers we'll plan a special night like okay maybe you take him and go you know take him out um, go to dinner, have some talks, go to a movie, and then go to, out to eat. And, you know, having that time so that they feel comfortable sharing those things. With my littles, it's always like, you know, as they're going to bed, <laughs> all of a sudden they want to share everything about their day. And I have to say the other night, somehow we ended up talking about spies because my my two youngest were talking about their, their aliases if they were spies. So they were coming up with their own alias names, which was pretty fun. And then all of a sudden it got on the topic of um, spies killing people. And I, I said, well, do you think mommy and daddy? Because they know we we talk openly. That's one of the things I mentioned in the book is that when all the kids turned eight, we told them we were CIA. But with the littles, since we don't work there, they've known since they were babies. And I said, well, do you think mommy and daddy killed people? And my six-year-old says, well, yeah, I mean, you were spies and that's what spies do. And it's like you're saying, like, you don't, we don't know what's going on in their head. And I'm like sitting here thinking, like, has my six year old just been walking around thinking that I was like an assassin and that I killed people? Like, I'm so glad that this has come up so that I can address it and tell him, well, actually, honey, if a spy has to pull out her gun, something has gone terribly wrong. <laughs> she has done something wrong. And so I went through the whole spies operated in the shadows. We're actually collecting information. We're not killing people. And he's like, huh. You know, I'm like wondering how long has he been walking around thinking that his mom is a stone cold killer? I don't know. (laughs) Well, I'm interested in this because obviously that is the classical view. We look at movies and TV and danger is the name of the game with spies. And of course, being in CIA, you are more aware of the ever-present danger around the world, every part of the globe, probably than even your most informed news watcher. So how do you view danger as a parent? Because it's obviously everyone's worst nightmare for their children. And you tell in the book that the CIA teaches get off the X. What does that mean? And how did you instill this in your kids so that they could avoid danger? Uh, Get Off the X is one of the most important principles we learn at the CIA. And it's basically the X means danger. And it can come in a variety of forms. It can be a person, a place, a thing, an environment. And the idea is that the longer you stay on the X, the more likely it is that you will be harmed. And so we teach our kids this concept in a variety of ways. And some of the key takeaways are, you know, listening to your gut and it's teaching them, you know, what does that mean? And when I'm in a situation, what does it mean to listen to my gut? And sometimes that actually means ignoring authority figures, believe it or not, which can be a very nuanced thing to teach kids, especially, you know, my very black and white thinking kindergartner. <laughs> um, but he's getting there <laughs> because the idea is that in an emergency, and this goes for adults as well, sometimes people in positions of authority don't actually know the right thing to do. And so one of the examples 
is there's this this really fascinating uh, story from 9-11 uh, about the VP of corporate security for Morgan's, I want to say it was Morgan Stanley. Um, I don't have my notes and I hope I'm not messing that up. Basically, when the, the plane hit the first tower, the New York Port Authority told everyone in the second tower to stay put. And he had been actually running emergency drills because he was concerned after the first terrorist attack on the World Trade Center that it would happen again. Again. And because they still had a lease, he wanted to move their offices. I think it was like 2,800 employees. And they didn't want to move because you know their lease wasn't up. And so he was doing these regular, regular emergency drills. So when that first plane hit and the New York Port Authority said, you know, everybody stay put in the tower, he said, no, I'm getting my people out of here. And he did. And I think it was all but a couple people, including himself, unfortunately, that did not live because he went back in to make sure everyone got out. But it was quick thinking like that. He was listening to to his gut and thinking critically about what to do and not necessarily listening to, you know, the voice on the intercom. And the example I give in the book is the Korean ferry boat disaster in 2014. 304 out of 476 passengers died, and many of them were children. They were in their rooms because the voice of authority over the intercom said, everybody stay in your room. And it was the kids who didn't follow the rules that got out of the room that were the ones who survived, right? And so we want our kids, if they're in a situation like this to listen to their gut and get out. And so we use a lot of examples in movies. We'll pause movies and, you know, show our kids what this me- what this looks like. You know, this person listening listening to their gut. And, you know, with our kids, there's a great example in Finding Nemo of when Marlon and Dory are, um, you know, swimming through the jellyfish and Dory says, I think we should go, you know, over them or through them or whatever. And, um, you know, that was her gut. You know, obviously she had short-term memory loss and that's a whole other thing. But it's a great example of pausing it. And then there are more mature examples I talk about in the movie Taken, uh, where the girls are leaving the airport and they're exchanging glances about giving information to this man. And so we use you know more mature examples like that for our older kids. But there are ways to illustrate what listening to your gut looks like. And then talking about authority figures and we role play with our kids as well. But then also visualizing our escape route when we go somewhere, getting our kids used to the idea of knowing where the exits are. And there are ways that we can do this that don't feel paranoid and scary for our kids. Because I also like to say that, you know, we're preparing them for something that statistically should not happen to them, right? But, you know, even if it's a small statistic, that's someone, right? And we want our kids to be over-prepared, but not in a paranoid way. And so it's important that you do things like emphasize adventure and emphasize fun when you're talking about these topics. And then as they get older, they can understand the more seriousness of this. But you know, one of the things we do with with the kids when the bigs were little is, you know, get off the X. We would drive down this road where all of a sudden there was a fork in the road. And at the last minute, Ryan would say, someone's following us. And he would, you know, jerk the wheel um, to the right. And, oh, we lost him. Of course, in real espionage, you would never do that unless you were in a James Bond movie. Um, <laughs> but that's just a, an illustration of there's danger behind us we need to get away, right? And so it's attuning our kids to not freezing in those scenarios. And so if you've talked through them and they have a game plan and they understand escape routes and getting off the X, they're less likely to freeze in that situation. And the hope is that they will say, okay, uh, this is an X, I need to get out of here, right? And we talk about run, hide, fight, um, you know, running would be get off the X. And this is taught in, you know, corporate security as well. Running would be get off the X. Hiding would be your second option. And the worst option, it's the last, you know, one that you want to employ is fighting because, you know, that's, you, you're less likely to to survive or, or not be injured because that means you're still on the X and you haven't gotten out of there. And so we talk about giving our kids some self-defense skills as well, but also making sure our kids understand the fragility of the human body because we see so much in movies where people just take punch after punch after punch and they survive. And it's like, real life is not like that. Sometimes all it takes is one punch. And if you're outweighed by someone, you really don't stand a chance. And so we talk about having them avoid those scenarios. But if they are in them, we talk about the idea of equalizers. And that doesn't have to be a weapon. It can be anything. You know, if you're in a classroom, it can be a chair. It can be, you know, something on the desk, any anything that you could throw at something, at someone if there is danger. And and I hate that we even have to think about things like this. I really do. You know, when we went to my son's kindergarten for like the open house, you know, one of the first things we did was ask the teacher, you know, what's your lockdown approach and what do you do and where are 
are the exits and and understanding all that. And and I wish we didn't have to ask those things or worry about those things. But the hope is that if we have a plan, uh, our kids will have a better chance to survive if they find themselves in a situation like that. Uh, you said a lot there, and there's a, a couple of points that I, I want to bring up. And 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 one, you mentioned that you wish you didn't have to ask these questions. Now, as a concerned parent, I can understand. However, there's a, the other side of that. It, it is you are getting clarity and comfort and building trust by asking those questions and having an, an understanding of that. Another thing, if you go to a venue, uh, a social event, and you have a lot of anxiety going on, that only means that there's a lot of questions that don't have answers. Mapping out the venue, right? Looking for those exits is one of those things that will drop that anxiety. Looking at who are the employees? Who is the manager? Who is the organizing the event? Answering these questions will, will fill in the blanks, which reduces that anxiety. For a, a lot of our clients who they haven't been out networking in a while, they've been married for a while, They're, they, they want to shake the box and put a lot of new things into their life to take advantage of all the technology that we have and all the opportunities that, that you have. But what comes with that is that anxiety of doing all these new things. So filling in those blanks, getting those questions answered is going to help that. And then the other thing about that is your children are going to model that behavior. So they're not going to go into a venue and freak out and allow their anxiety to take them over. They are going to do the same things that you did. Analyze the room, map out where the exits are, who the people are in there. And familiarizing is getting familiar with the, the contextual uh, atmosphere here. Yeah. Having that preparation, I think is key because it helps us with our own anxiety. And like you said, it can help our kids, but then it can also help us when we're worrying about whether or not they're going to be safe because we have a piece knowing that they have the skill set that we've prepared them to be out in the world. And it I like to say too if if there's a situation that you know beforehand you're going to be anxious in and you don't want your child to then model that anxious behavior, right? So for me, it's things like heights, skiing. And and so there are some circumstances where I let Ryan take the lead with the kids because for instance, I have seen for, you know, the early years of our kindergartner's life is that he would constantly look to me as the barometer. Like dad would tell him he could do something, but he would look to me to make sure it was okay. And then even if I said it was okay, he could read my face and know that I really didn't think it was okay. And he'd be like, I don't think so, dad. And so there are some situations where I take the back seat and I let Ryan take the lead. So for example, a couple years ago when he learned to ski, I didn't go until he had already learned. And I went to cheer him on after he was fully confident, watched him go up the chairlift and almost, you know, just like, <laughs> and just smiled like I wasn't terrified and he was doing great. And so it's kind of knowing our own, I don't want to say weaknesses, but knowing our own foibles as parents and our own um, idiosyncrasies, I'll say, because uh, things that we don't want to pass down to our kids and just being aware of those things. And so when I do have the ability to let Ryan take the lead on some of those things that I know just are really uncomfortable for me, you know, things like climbing giant boulders that I never did as a child because I grew up in Chicago area with like cornfields. So there was no rock climbing for me. So it's situations like that where I have to kind of take a breath and either let him be there the first few times, or I just have to really be aware of my facial expressions and energy that I'm giving off and just smile. (laughs) Well, the book is full of so many great lessons and values that I think parents can definitely enjoy. I don't think we have enough time to get to all of them today. We love asking our guests what their X factor is. What do you think makes you unique and extraordinary, Christina? I think probably having been at the CIA and done both worlds, both the analytic side and the clandestine side, I think really gives me an edge because I have the skill set to write, which obviously I'm doing now as a writer. And but it also gives me the ability to connect with people and build relationships of trust and kind of that full, the ultimate you know, example of being well-rounded is having both of those experiences and having that uh, CIA background, I think really 
gives me an edge. And I really believe that people from the CIA, they, they make you really terrified of leaving the agency. Like, oh, we're going to take care of you here. Like, it's a big, scary world out there. You don't want to go to the private sector. <laughs> but once you're out, you realize that you have been trained to do any job. Now it's up to you to convince someone to hire you and for you to explain to them how your skills translate. But you really do come with this X factor of these amazing abilities that really are transferable to so many different career paths. Well, we appreciate you sharing your experiences with us and our audience. Where can they find out more about the book and all these great lessons? They can go to my website, christinahillsburg.com or follow me on Instagram at Christina Hillsburg to keep up with updates uh, for parenting tips from Licensed to Parent and also keep up with what I'm doing next. All right. Thank you for joining us, Christina. Thanks so much. 